We are an independent spirit filled church in North Fort Worth. We are Mercy Life Church. Wow. Okay. So what a testimony there. There's a lot that was in there. Um, just this idea that, I mean, this little child recognized that she had evil in her heart uh, toward another person uh, and that she had to pray about it um, and, you know, ask, ask God to help her through it. Um, the idea that, you know, uh, her mom just kept telling her again and again, stay humble, stay humble, stay humble. Um, but it's, to me, this is uh, one of the things that it annoys me about some churches is that a lot of churches think that a child is too young to profess their faith. And here we have, uh, I believe Bailey may have been about six or seven when she recorded this video, and here she is professing her faith. So um going to skip good grief. Uh, which is, yeah, there's a lot of scripture. <laughs> okay. And, okay, so uh, I am William Henley. I am the uh, executive associate pastor here. Uh, and this means I not only help preach, but I do a lot of the administrative stuff behind the scenes and stuff. Um and yeah, this week was uh, tough on both of us. Uh, I've been in class all week. Uh, I'm working on my doctorate. And um, this week was residency week. So I've literally been in class from 9 to 5. Actually, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday is like 5.30 every single day. Um, so it's been a rough, rough, rough week on me. Um, I still have Tristan's uh, message from last week to edit, but hey, I got some new equipment and hopefully um, in the future, we're not going to have issues like that. So the message of today's sermon is why Israel matters or why Israel is important, um, however you want to title it. So first of all, let, uh, I think we need to get a bit of perspective of what Israel is. So hopefully this video will work. Um, and work. here it goes. Okay. So uh, here we are. Uh, we're crossing Africa, and here we see Israel. Um, and uh, it's a little bitty country. Watch as we back up here. Um and you see, there's uh, Europe up there. Um, and I'm sorry if it is uh, grainy and breaking up. But, um, yeah, so Israel is, yeah, it is a tiny, tiny country. Um, probably should have double-checked that video before I put it up there. So, um, Israel is this tiny country in the middle of the Middle East, um, on the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and uh, of course today, um, it's kind of an arid region. Uh, this is due mainly to, um, an ec um, eco ecological disaster that actually happened at some point in the Bible. Um, it used to be this beautiful, luscious land. Um, even Lebanon, which today is a desert, used to have, um, forest all around it. So, uh, why is Israel important? And so, I think we're going to start off today, and by the way, first uh, couple of things I need to mention is, one, I'm preaching without notes today. Um, and because I know this content well enough that I should be able to preach, but you may hear a lot of ums and uhs because I'm preaching without notes. Uh, second thing is, is there is a ton of scripture we're unpacking today. We're unpacking between four to five chapters of scripture. Yeah, yeah tons of scripture. So the first thing we're going to talk about on why Israel is important is the Abrahamic covenant. Now, uh, one of the things I want to point out is that in the Bible, 
uh, there's actually three different covenants that's made to Abraham. I believe in my notes we're covering two of them. So, I'm going to start off here in Genesis 12. And it says, The Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your native land and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Listen to this. I will bless those who bless you, and curse him that curses you. And all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will assign this land to your heirs. And he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared before him. What does this mean? Well, okay, so from Abraham, uh, Abraham, of course, had uh, the uh, child of the flesh and the child of the promise. The child of the flesh was Ishmael, um, who um, pretty much all... Um, Muslims, Islams are uh, descended from. And then you have uh, his son of the promise, which is Isaac. Yeah. Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Jacob is called Israel. <laughs> so, uh, and so he promised that the people who... Uh, that his offspring, he promised him this land and, oh, wait, yeah. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless your name. I will make your name great. So I will make of you a great nation. We're talking about Israel here. And I will bless those who bless you and curse him that curses you. Yeah. So let's not forget this. Okay, so I believe now we're about to hit the second one and this looks like it's a long piece of scripture so come on okay. go to Genesis 15 and this is out of the tree of life version which the last one I read out of the Tanakh uh, this one the Tanakh Torah uh, Nadi and Ketvim this is out of the tree of life version which is I just learned this week it's actually a paraphrase from a Jewish perspective and it's not a direct translation. But anyway, after these things, the words of Adonai came to Abram in addition, saying, Do not feel fear, Abram. I am your shield, your very, very great reward. But Abram said, My Lord Adonai, what will you give me since I am living without children and the heir of my household is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no seed, so a houseborn servant is my heir. Then behold, the word of Adonai came to him, saying, This one will not be your heir, but in fact, one who come from your own body will be your heir. So, this, so now we're talking about um, Isaac. He took him outside and said, Look up now at the sky and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said, so shall your seed be. Then he believed in Adonai, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am Adonai who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to give you this land to inherit it. So once again, this is the land promise. Israel belongs to Israel, uh, 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 to the Jews. Um. And here's some, uh, you know what, I'll get to this here in a minute. Remind me to come back to that thought. Um, my Lord Adonai, how will I know that I will inherit it? Then he said, bring me a three-year-old young cow, a three-year-old she-goat, and a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young bird. So he brought all these things to him and cut them in half and put each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. Then the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. When the sun was about to set and a deep sleep fell on Abram, behold, terror of great darkness was falling upon him. Then he said to Abram, so this is God, 
know for certain that your seed will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. But I am going to judge the nation that they will serve. Afterward, they will go out with many possessions. But you, you will come to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here, for the inequity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So God's not ready to kill the Amorites yet, but he's going to kill them in the future because of the future sins that God knows they're going to commit. When the sun set and it became dark, behold, there is a smoking oven and a fiery torch that passed between the pieces. And on that day, Adonai cut a covenant with Abraham, saying, I give this land to your seed from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the Kenthites, the Kizanites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Euraphites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergesites, and the Zebusites. Uh, whoo! Uh, okay, so there was something I was wanting to talk about. Was it on this slide? Let me pull it up. Let's see. And he said, no, for certain that, okay, I don't think this was there. It, was, it might have been this one. And I, yes, you are right. Well, then he said, okay, you know what? I said I was going to come back to it, but I can't remember what I said I was going to come back to you. Okay, whatever. Okay, so what this is, is this is, once again, this is the land promise. Uh, so, uh, oh, 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 yeah, land promise. Okay, covenant, covenant, covenant. When God makes a promise, he does not break it. This land, by God's divine will, belongs to the Jews. Okay, so... Next thing we're talking about is the Mosaic Covenant. So, uh, now, of course, once again, God made quite a few um, promises between um, himself and the people after they came out of Egypt. So, the one we're focusing on today is out of Exodus 19. And it says, in the third month after Benai Yisrael had gone out of the land of Egypt, Benai Yisrael, this means the children of Israel, so the descendants of Jacob, had gone out of the land of Egypt. That same day they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. They traveled from Rephidim, came into the wilderness of Sinai, and set up camp in the wilderness. Israel camped there right in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and Adonai called to him from the mountain, saying, Say this to the house of Jacob, and tell Benai Yisrael, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Remember, eagles' wings, uh, uh, did we discuss this here, or was this that gateway we discussed this, where we talked about how an eagle soars? I don't know if we, I don't... Yeah, that was probably gateway. Yeah. Okay, so um, an eagle soars. So when he says, I have brought you out of eagle's wings, it means that they have come here quickly. And uh, uh, without, um, without any issues. Now then, if you listen closely to my voice and keep my covenant, if you do this, I will do this then you will be my own treasure from among all people, for all the earth is mine. So, as for you, you will be to me a kingdom of Kohanim. So, uh, th this is actually, um, I'll come back to that, and a holy nation. These are the words which you are to speak to Benai Yisrael. Okay, so, uh, Kohanim, we see Kohan uh, there in that word. So this is a priestly, or a, uh, uh, you will be to me a kingdom of priests, of worshipers, and a holy nation. So uh, now we're going to get into the next set of scripture. Um, and this is the Davidic 
covenant. Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. Then King, King David went in and sat before Adonai and said, Who am I, my Lord Adonai, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? Yet this was a small thing in your eyes, my Lord Adonai, for you have spoken also of your servant's house for the distant future. This is a revelation for humanity, my Lord Adonai. What more can David add in speaking to you? For you already know your servant, my Lord Adonai. For the sake of your word and according to your heart, you have done everything great, revealing this to your servant. Therefore, you are great, my Lord Adonai. For there is none like you, and there is no other God beside you, as we have all heard with our own ears. When one nation on earth is like you, your people, like Israel, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for himself a name, to do for you a great thing and awesome deeds for your land, before your people who you have redeemed for yourself and for Egypt, driving out nations and their gods. So you establish for yourself your people, Israel, as your very own people forever, and you, Adonai, have become their God. So basically what all this uh, is saying is that you have been great to us, to Israel, and um, we have become your people, you have become our God forever. Thanks. Forever. Okay, we're going to skip over now to, uh, and this is more of the Davidic covenant. And this is what is really, really important. This is out of Isaiah. This is a prophecy. Isaiah 16. A throne will be established in mercy, and one will sit on it in truth. In the tent of David, one who seeks justice and is ready for righteousness. What? Um, Isaiah is saying here is that the promised Messiah is going to come from the household of David. Once again, in Jeremiah, now Jeremiah gives a messianic prophecy. Behold, days are coming. It is a declaration of Adonai when I will fulfill the good word and I spoke concerning the house of Israel and concerning the house of Judah. In those days and at the right time, I will cause a branch of righteousness to spring up for David, once again from one of David's heirs, uh, one, uh, or ch grandchildren of uh, David, and he will execute justice and righteousness in the land. Yeah. In those days will Judah be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which he will be called, Adonai, or righteousness. For thus says Adonai, for David, there will not be cut off a man sitting on the throne of the house of Israel, nor will the Levitical Kahanim ever like a man before me to offer burnt offerings. So this is the uh, Le Le Levi priest. Uh, will ever like a man before me to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices continually. Sure. Once again, from the house of David will come the, uh, will come the Messiah, and I will establish this covenant forever. Covenant forever. God does not break his promises. So, now we're getting into a part of the Bible that most people think is boring, but is extremely important. And I was just going to list this, but God said this morning, nope, you're going to recite it. Cheat help. So, starting in Matthew, verse 1. Once again, this is Tree of Life version. The book of the genealogy of Yeshua HaMashiach. Uh, for those of you who don't speak Hebrew, Yeshua, Jesus, Ha, the Mashiach, the Messiah. Jesus, the Messiah, 
Jesus the Anointed One, or in uh, Greek, Latin, and English, uh, Jesus, Jesus, um, Jesus Christ. The book of the genealogy of Yeshua, or Jesus Christ. Ben David, Ben means son, son of David. Ben Abraham, son of Abraham. Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac fathered Jacob. Jacob fathered Judah, or Israel, and his brothers. Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez fathered Helzon. Helzon fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nahashon. Nahashon fathered Salom. Right. Salom, which means peace, fathered Boaz by Rahab. Interesting. Salom, which means peace, fathered Boaz by the prostitute Rahab when they went into Jericho. <laughs> Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. So if you remember the book of Ruth, she married Boaz. And their son Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David the king. David fathered Solomon by his by the wife of Uri. If you remember, um, David committed adultery with Bathsheba, who was the wife of Uri. Bathsheba gave birth to Solomon. Solomon fathered Rehoboam. Rehoboam fathered Abijah. Abijah fathered Asa. Asa fathered Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat fathered Joram. Joram fathered Uzziah, Uzziah fathered Jotham, Jotham fathered Ahaz, Ahaz fathered Hezekiah. Hezekiah fathered Manash, yeah, Manash. Manash fathered Amon, Amon fathered Josiah, and Josiah fathered Jeconah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. So the Babylonian exile. So, uh, the Babylonian exile, there were no further kings of Egypt, uh, I mean, of Israel, no further kings of Israel. After the Babylonian exile, Jeconan fathered Sihotel, Sihotel fathered Jerubbabel, Jerubbabel fathered Abud, Abud fathered Elakim, Elakim fathered Azor, Azor fathered Zadok, Zadok fathered Akim, Akim fathered Elud, Elud followed Eleazar, Eleazar fathered Mathen, Mathen fathered Jacob, and Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Miriam, or Mary, from whom was born Yeshua, who is called the Messiah. Mm-hmm. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the Babylonian exile are 14 generations. And from the Babylonian exile until the Messiah are 14 generations. Yeshua was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son of uh, as was supposed of Joseph, the son of Hillel. Okay, um, you do realize there is a slightly different genealogy here in Luke. Um, it, but it's actually not as different as you might think because um, what we have here is we have, in Matthew, we have the Jewish lineage. In Luke, we have the biological lineage. What is the difference? Well, under Jewish law, if uh, the um, first husband died without having a male heir, then the brother was supposed to sleep with the wife until they had a male heir. But the thing... So, that would be the biological father, 
but uh, as far as he, uh, Jewish law was concerned, it would be under the lineage of the first husband. So this is the difference here. So Luke actually goes backward. Joseph was the son of Hillel, the son of Mathite, the son of Levi, the son of Malachi, the son of Johnny, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esel, the son of Nagai, the son of Math, the son of Matthias, the son of Suraman, the son of Zosek, the son of J Jodah, the son of Joanna, the son of Risha, the son of Jerubbabel, the son of Silatil, the son of Nerai, the son of Melchi, the son of Adai, the son of Kosem, the son of Elmadam, the son of Er, the son of Joshua, the son of Elizal, the son of Joram, the son of Matthi, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonahan, the son of Elikim, the son of Melilah, the son of Mena, the son of Matatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salem, the son of Nahushan, the son of Arimadab, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Rehu, the son of Peleg, the son of Aber, the son of Selah, the son of Canaan, the son of Aprizad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Kenon, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Why did we go through all of this? Pastor Tristan, any idea why we might, what I, uh, we just went through all of this? I know a lot. Jesus was Jewish. <laughs> a lot of people seem to miss this. Yeshua was Jewish. <laughs> so, uh, I am now going to jump over and we're going to go here to Luke 15. Then Yeshua said, a certain young man had two sons and the younger of them said to the father, father, give me the share of the property that comes with it. So he divided his wealth between them. Okay, you know this, this story, right? It's the story of the prodigal son. So, any idea what I'm going to be discussing? Check this out. I just skipped over the entire middle of the story. Now his older son was out in the field, and as he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called out to one of the servants and began to ask what these things could be. Mm -hmm. The servant said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has cured the fattened calf because he got him back safe and sound. But the older son was angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came outside and pleaded with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, so many years I have slaved away for you. Not once did I ignore your order. We're coming back to this. Yet, You've never given me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, the one who has squandered your wealth with prostitutes, for him you have killed the fattened calf. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and everything that is mine is yours. What does this have to do with... Um, why Israel is important. Look, so many years I have slaved away for you, not once did I ignore your order. The older son is Israel who has kept the law. Yeah. They have kept the Mosaic Covenant. Mm -hmm. The 
uh, the in this story, the younger son represents the Gentile, you and me, or most of us who are watching. I do know we do have some Jews watching. The father said, son, you are always with me and everything that is mine is yours. What does this mean? The promise has never been taken away from Israel. Going to go over here until uh, Matthew 5, 18. Amen, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or seraph shall ever pass away from the Torah until all things come to pass. Nothing in the Old Testament is done away by stuff that is in the New Testament. What does this mean? It means that the promise still applies to Israel. Can I head over to Acts 1? 6 through 7. So when they gathered together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? And he said to them, It is not your place to know the times or the seasons for which the Father has placed under his control. What does this mean? It means that in the due process of time, the kingdom is going to be restored to Israel. And in fact, this is actually in the book of Revelation. The, the kingdom of Zion, the city of Zion, is um, uh, not only is it the heavenly city, but it's when heaven and earth uh, marry and are recreated. Um, Jerusalem, Zion, are the same. Oh. Galatians 3. Dear brothers and sisters, here's an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or amend an irrevocable agreement, so it is in this case. Remember, no one can set aside or amend an irrevocable agreement. God made an irrevocable agreement between himself and Israel. God, and in fact, it goes on. God gave the promise to Abraham and his child. And notice the scripture doesn't say to his children, as if it meant many descendants. Rather, it says to his child, and that, of course, means Christ. Remember, there was the uh, child he had of the promise, and there was the child he had with Hagar, which was Ishmael. So, we are discussing once again Israel. Yeah. This is what I am trying to say. The agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses. God would be breaking his promise. For if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, then it would not have been the result of accepting God's promise but God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show the people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. God gave his law through the angels to Moses who was the mediator between God and his people. Now, a mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is one, did not use a mediator when he gave his promise to Abraham. Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the scripture declares that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. 
we were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was made our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. <laughs> Does this mean we no longer have to keep the dietary law? Oh. Sorry, SDA. <laughs> For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And, oh, 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 wait a second. Uh -oh. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. Does that mean we still have to observe, observe church on the Sabbath? Sorry, SDA. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been uh, united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. My had to. And now, that you belong to Christ. You are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. And God promises to Abraham belongs to you. Because of Christ Jesus, it's no longer just the Jews. The promise now extends to everyone who accepts Christ as his Savior. You're going to be to it. Yeah. <sighs> But why is Israel still important if the promise now extends to us all? Now we're going to hit a ton, a ton. We are about to cover three entire chapters of the New Testament. So before we do this, I need water. <laughs> I did this. We need to walk. Very good decision. <laughs> I think break. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. So, three whole chapters of the New Testament about why Israel is important. Better grab your fuck fuck. Where could this possibly be? Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 1. With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. They are the people of Israel, chosen by chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them and gave them his law. He gave them the privileges of worship him. Listen, he gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the ancestors, and Christ himself was an Israelite. He, Christ himself was a Jew. He was from Israel as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God, the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Well then, has God failed to fulfill his promise to Israel? No. For not all who are born into the nation of Israel are truly members of God's people. 
Being descendants of Abraham doesn't make them truly Abraham children. For the scripture says, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Though Abraham had other children too. He's talking about Ishmael and Ishmael's descendants. This means that Abraham's physical descendants are not necessarily the children of God. Only the children of the promise are considered to be Abraham's children. For God had promised, I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. This son was her ancestor, Isaac. When he married Rebekah, she gave birth to twins. But before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad, she received a message from God. This message shows that God chooses his people according to his purpose. He calls people, but not according to their good or bad works. So he called him before he was born. She was told, your older son will serve your younger son. In the words of the scripture, I loved Jacob, but I rejected Esau. Are we saying then that God was unfair? Of course not. For God said to Moses, I will sow mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. So it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor work for it. Mer we are not given mercy by our works. Sorry, IBLP. <laughs> yeah, I'm just sitting here smacking down everyone today, aren't I? For the scripture says that God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power in you and to spread my fame throughout the earth. So you see, God chooses to show mercy to some and he chooses to harden the hearts of others so that they refuse to listen to him. He's talking about Pharaoh here. Well then, you might say, why did God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what he makes them do? No, don't say that. Who are you, a mere human being, to argue with God? Oh, I know. Should the thing that was created say to the one who created it, why have you made me like this? <clears throat> when a potter makes jars out of clay, doesn't he have a right to use the same lump of clay to make one jar for decoration and another one to throw garbage into you? In the same way, even though God has the right to show his anger and his power, he is very patient with those on whom his anger falls, who are destined for destruction. He does this to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy, who were prepared in advance for glory. And we are among those whom he has selected, both from the Jews and from the Gentiles. Concerning the Gentiles, God says in the prophecy of Hosea, those who are not my people, I will now call my people. Those of us who were not Jews, God is now calling his people. And I will love those whom I did not love before. And then at the place where they were told, you are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. If you're, if you're not Jewish, this should be uh, speaking to you. But concerning Israel, this is, so listen up if you're Jewish. Israel the prophet cried out, Though the people of Israel are numerous as the sand of the sea, so only a remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth quickly and fi with finality. And Isaiah said that su the same thing in another place. If the Lord of heaven's armies had not spread a few of our children, we would have been wiped out like Sodom, destroyed like Gomorrah. So the people of Israel were scattered so they wouldn't be destroyed. 
What does all this mean? Even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they were made right with God. And it was by faith that this took place. But the people of Israel who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law never succeeded. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of by trusting in him. Uh They cared more about the works than about their relationship with the Father. They stumbled over the great rock in their path. God warned them of this in the scriptures when he said, I am placing a stone in Jerusalem that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. But anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Chapter 10. Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all, all, all Jew and Gentile who believe in him are made right with God. For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commandments. But faith's way of getting right with God says, don't say in your heart, who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down to earth? And don't say he will go down to the place of dead to bring Christ back to life again. In fact, it says, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we have preached. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord, Jew and Gentile. They have the same God who gives generously to all who call on him, the older son and the younger son. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scripture says how beautiful are the feet of the ones who bring good news. But not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord who has believed, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from hearing, that is, hearing the good news about Christ. But I ask, have the people of Israel actually heard the message? Yes, they have. The message has gone throughout the earth and the words to all of the world. But I ask, the Did the people of Israel really understand? Yes, they did. For even in the time of Moses, God said, I will rouse your jealousy through people who are not even a nation. I will provoke your anger through the foolish Gentiles. What does this mean? It means that um, God is going to 
extend his promise to the Gentiles, to those who don't even have an, their own nation. And this is going to provo provoke anger and jealousy from the Jews because the uh, promise was extended to the Gentiles. And later, Isaiah spoke boldly for God, saying, I was found by people who were not looking for me. That is us, the Gentile. I showed myself to those who were not asking for me. But regarding Israel, God said, all day long, I opened my arms to them. But they were disobedient and rebellious. I asked then, has God rejected his own people, the nation of Israel? Pay attention to this. Of course not. God has not rejected his people. God has not rejected Israel. This is very, very, very important, and we're going to come back to this. I myself am an Israelite. This is Paul speaking. A descendant of Abraham and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. No, God has not rejected his own people, whom he chose from the very beginning. He chose them from the very beginning. Do you not realize what the scripture says about this? Elijah the prophet complained to God about the people of Israel and said, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. And do you remember what God said? He said, no, I have 7,000 others who have never bowed down to Baal. Baal. This is before Elijah went up and confronted the, the prophets of Jezebel. It is the same day for a few people, for, it is the same today for a few of the people of Israel have remained faithful because of God's grace, his undeserved God kindness in choosing them. And since it is through God's kindness, then it is not by their good works. For in that case, God's grace would not have been what it really is, free and undeserved. Mm -hmm. So this is the situation. Most of the people of Israel have not found the favor of God they are looking for so earnestly. But a few have. The one God had chosen but the hearts of the rest were hardened. As the scripture says, God has put them into a deep sleep. To this day, he has shut their eyes so they do not see and closed their ears so they do not hear. Likewise, David said, let the bountiful table become a snare, a trap that makes them think all is well. That let their blessings cause them to stumble and let them get what they deserve. Let their eyes be go blind so they cannot see and let their backs be bent forever. Did God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? Israel did not fall beyond recovery. Of course not. They were disobedient. So God made salvation available to the Gentiles. But he wanted his own people to become jealous and claim it salvation for themselves. Now, if the Gentiles were enriched because the people of Israel turned down God's offer of salvation, think how much greater a blessing the world would share when they finally accept it. Paul is saying that in the, in, uh, at the end of time, Israel will accept it. I am saying all this especially for you Gentiles. God has appointed me as the apostle to the Gentiles. I stress this. For I want somehow to make the people of Israel jealous for what you Gentiles have, so that I might save some of them. For since the rejection meant that God offered salvation to the rest of the world, their acceptance of it will be even more wonderful. Listen to this. If you are a Jew who has accepted Christ as Messiah, the salvation to you will be more wonderful than it is to us, according to Romans 11. It will be a life for those who were beyond dead. Who were dead. Who were dead. I don't know where I got the word beyond from. So, now you bet. 
And since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, their descendants will also be holy, just as the entire batch of dough is holy, because the portion given as an offering is holy. This is about the tithe here. If you, uh, if you tithe, do your tithe and it is blessed, then, um, then the entire uh, money is blessed. Just likewise, it says here, uh, the descendants of Abraham or, uh, were holy, and because of that, their descendants were holy. So, if you're Jewish, you are holy. For if the roots of the tree are holy, the branches will be too. We're almost done. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel have been broken off. And you Gentiles, who were branches from a wild olive tree, have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing. God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. But you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. Listen to this. Us Gentiles were grafted in to the, the um, olive tree. What this means is we were adopted. God, cho God chose to bring us in with his other children. Mm -hmm. But don't brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. God's people who um, rejected him. You are just a branch, not the root. Well, you must say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. Why? Yes, but remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. And you are there because you do believe. So don't think highly of yourself. Don't think highly of yourself for being a Christian. But fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Ooh. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe toward those who disobeyed, but kind to you if you continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you will also be cut off. And if the people of, what does this mean? It sounds like you can lose your salvation. And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. For God has the power to graft them back into the tree. So those who have uh, refused to believe can actually be brought back in if they do believe. You, by nature, were a branch cut from the wild olive tree. So, if God was willing to do something contrary to nature by grafting you in to his cultivated tree, he will be far more eager to graft the original branches back into the tree where they belong. So remember, you, uh, us Gentiles will cultivate it in, but look at how much more eager he's going to be to graft back in the Jews who believe in him. I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles come to Christ. And so all Israel will be saved. As the scripture says, the one who rescues will come from Jerusalem we're talking about Jesus, and he will turn Israel away from ungodlessness. And this is my covenant with them, that I will take away their sins. Many of the people of Israel are now enemies of the good news, and this benefits you Gentiles. Enemies of the good news. Yet they are still the people he loves. Listen to this. He is still the people he loves because he chose their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
just because you turn your back on God, you are still God's children. He still loves you. For God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Listen to this. The covenant, the promise, God's gift and his call can never be withdrawn. Once you Gentiles were rebels against God, but when the people of Israel rebelled against him, God was merciful to you instead. Now they are rebels, and God's mercy has come to you so that they too were share in God's mercy. For God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience so he could have mercy on everyone. Oh, how great are God's riches! and wisdom and knowledge how impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways for who can know the lord's thoughts who knows enough to give him advice and who has given so much that he needs to pay it back for everything comes from him and exists by his power and is attended for his glory all glory to him forever. Amen. <sighs> okay, we're, we're in the final stretch. And I need water. So, why is Israel important? Because the covenant was never taken away from him. The covenant for salvation was extended to us Gentiles. But the Israel is still God's chosen people. There is something we hear a lot in Christianity called um, replacement the theology. Replacement theology says the promise was taken away from Israel when they rejected Christ and given to the Gentiles. From what we've just read in Romans, replacement theology is not only anti uh, unbiblical, but it's anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. Saying that the promise was taken away from Israel is literally speaking out against Israel and the Jewish people. It is anti-Semitic. Read Romans. Read Romans. It's, it's amazes me that someone came up with an entire theology about this. Have you not read your Bible? This is the word of God. It is uh, who it says I am. And I'm quoting Joel Osteen. Um, <laughs> and, um, and but li listen, um, if Romans in the New Testament, in the New Testament, the New Covenant says that the promise has never been taken away from Israel, then who are you theologians to say that the uh, covenant has been taken away from Israel? Read your Bible. Um, you know what? Let, let's go ahead and do a quick prayer, and then I'm going to have a uh, Pastor Tristan come up. Um, and Father, I just pray for everyone here today. I know we threw a lot of scripture at people, probably stuff that they've never heard before. Lord. We love your people, both Jew and Gentile. We, we know that Israel is your children. We know that we are all your children. You love, you love Israel, even though that they turn your back on us, uh, on, on you. You love us because we have trusted in you. You have adopted us in. You have adopted us in with your, uh, with your chosen children. Just like the younger son, the prodigal, you love us Gentiles for when we return to you and you celebrate. But just like in the story of the prodigal, 
you have always been with Israel and you have never left them. Lord, let us be a blessing to Israel so that Israel can be a blessing to the rest of the world. It's in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach that we pray. Amen. Tristan? Don't forget about the other. Yeah, I'm a hundred. It's like a kid. Wow. Wasn't that beautiful? Wow. You know, people take Israel as if it was God's second choice, but Israel was God's first choice. You know, there's no... Do I? Yes. Oh. There's no wonder that the world has been attacking Jews forever. Look at the Holocaust. You know, such a horrible time in, our, in the world's history. But it was an attack on Jews. There's no wonder. You know, so it's just so tragic, you know. But there's always a hope. And our hope is in Christ. So I just, I want to thank Pastor Paul for that amazing message. It's so powerful. You know, I think we could re-preach that message once a year because how much, how truth, how much truth is in it, you know. And it's so true that people have tried to replace theology. You know, replacement theology is not a good theology. Any theology other than this theology is bad theology. So, well, guys. Thank you for tuning in today. And just in case some of you wondering, we do have a phone, uh, a church phone for a pastor on call. Me and pastor will take turns with it. So if you need prayer, feel free to uh, call us or text too. And if you would, if you want to reach out through email, email is also available to you too. Out to Facebook. So, and you can reach out through Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, anywhere that you see Mercy Life and you see the church logo, you can reach out. So, uh, well, we want to thank you for joining us today here at Mercy Life Church, and we hope to see you again next week. Thank you. God bless.